I kept hearing this phrase going through my mind and um, couldn't figure it out. So I kept, so I kind of looked it up a little bit. I've heard of people say that Abraham was the friend of God. That's quite a mouthful. You know, we don't think about God as somebody who can be your friend. But it doesn't say it in Genesis where it tells the story of Abraham. doesn't say anything about that. But it says it later. In fact, in Isaiah, God speaking through the prophet Isaiah says, Abraham, who's my friend? That's pretty powerful. The God of the universe is a friend of a man. But you know, he did more than that with Abraham. You read about it, he called Abraham to go to a different country. He said, I'll bless you, and you will be a blessing. Came back later, and he said, I'm going to make a covenant with you, a contract. God making a contract with a man, like he was an equal or something. They made a covenant. And back then, a covenant was a, was a pretty big deal. It was you keep your end of the bargain, or me and my friends are going to come kill you. If I don't keep my end of the bargain, you and your friends are probably going to come kill me. It was serious. It was serious as a headache. God made a covenant with a man. They exchanged weapons. They exchanged clothes. They exchanged names. Abraham's new name was, I'm a friend of God. What a name. And God's new name was, I'm a friend of Abraham. That meant if I'm in trouble, you come and bail me out. If you're in trouble, I'll come. Well, how would God be in trouble that Abraham would come and bail him out? It just, on some sense, it just doesn't make sense in some ways. But nevertheless, God made a covenant with him. And that covenant still stands. You know, if you go to Romans chapter 4, let's go there a minute. Oh, Paul's talking about Abraham. If you start in there about verse 16, you see Abraham got these promises. He got a blessing, he got a promise, he got a covenant, got a new name. But he got the promise was the main thing. So Paul says in verse 16, Therefore the promise comes by faith. <coughs> by faith. That's believing. So that it may be by grace. Grace is what God does. All by himself. We don't deserve it. But grace is what God has done for us. Faith is... It's what we do with God's grace. We believe it. Therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed. There's another big word. Guaranteed. How many things are guaranteed these days? And somebody really stands behind it. Not too many things. Guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring. Not only those who are of the law, that is the Jews, they claim to be Abraham's offspring. Not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. That's us. He is the father of us all. All. Not just the Jews, not just the Christians, all. He said, I've made you a father of many nations. He is our Father in the sight of God, whom he believed. God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. 
Verse 18, he says, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. He was 100 years old. His wife was nearly that old. And the promise to him was that you'll be a father of many nations. He had no children. He said to God, I have no children. I mean, you're God and I'm your friend and all that. And this is all great. But, you know, by the way, I don't have any children. And God said, your wife will have a child. And against all hope, against all reason, Abraham believed God. He didn't waver in unbelief, but he strengthened his faith and he believed God. And in Genesis 15, 6, it says, and that belief in God was credited to him as righteousness. You got an account. You got an account in there. And my account before I met Jesus was was bad, full of all the bad stuff I'd done. All of it. But when you ask Jesus in your heart, all that that's bad in that account is taken away. Taken away, and instead it says righteous, justified. It's if a judge declares not guilty. You're accused of crimes you have committed, but the judge says not guilty. It was credited. It was counted to him as righteousness. He didn't earn it. He believed. He believed the promise. So the thing is, that promise is to the children of Abraham, too. It talks about his seed. His seed, not seeds, not offsprings, his offspring, one. That seed is Jesus. And so as we are in Jesus, all the promises of Abraham, all the covenant, all the blessing, the friendship, are ours. Ours. It's all ours. promise comes by faith and guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring. You know, it says in three different places, not in Genesis, but three different places that Abraham is God's friend. It says it in 2 Chronicles 20, it says it in Isaiah, and it says it in James. Abraham, God's friend, because that was his name. Guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring. You know, in John 15, 15, Jesus called his disciples friends. He said, I don't call you servants anymore. Men that followed a rabbi, a teacher, they were called servants. He said, I don't call you servants anymore because servants don't know what their master is doing. But I've told you everything I'm doing, and so I call you friends. You know, sometimes I think we get our minds kind of messed up with who is God and who is Jesus and who is the Holy Spirit. They're all the same. They're all one. And when Jesus said, you're my friend, that's God Almighty talking. That's the creator of the universe talking. Jesus is my friend. God is my friend. You know, it's hard sometimes to wrap our little brains around some of the things it says in the Bible, but that's an important one. We need to get it. You know, in Proverbs it says, uh, a friend loves at all time, but a brother is born for adversity. Anybody got a brother? Yeah. I love to see Lydia and Sean's little boys. They're about two years apart about three and five, something like that. And it's on. It's on all the time. The competition, the fight, the game, they're at it all the time. And they never stop. They sleep and they eat. But even then, they're plotting. They're thinking. They're looking at each other like, I'm going to get him. And it, they, they wrestle, they fight, they play, they steal each other's toys. It's on. There's always a competition. 
In fact, I'm still a little peeved at my older brother for beating me to heaven. What is that about? <laughs> Didn't even give me a chance. Just went. It's a competition. He used to kind of, <laughs> every time we were together and, and people we didn't know, he'd ask him, who's the oldest? Who do you think the oldest is? And I don't know if he made signs or what he did, but they always picked him. And he'd just laugh. He thought that was the best thing ever. He was nine years older than me. Anyway, brothers. There's adversity. Most of the time you make peace, but there's always competition. Young men are made that way. I've had a friend, a good friend, most of my life, met in college, and I see him once a year. We competed then. He could beat me at tennis. He played tennis all his life, and he could beat me at tennis. But I could outrun him. It made him so mad. He thought he was kind of fast. But we'd run from the dorm to the cafeteria. I'd always beat him. I think it still bothers him because it's a competition. You know, most friendships, somebody's a leader most of the time and somebody's a follower most of the time. There's, there's usually a Lone Ranger and there's usually a Tonto. There's usually a Han Solo and a Chewbacca. There's usually one guy that takes the lead. Where are we going to eat? I don't know. Well, let's go to Whataburger. Okay. Some guy doesn't care so much and maybe the other guy, other guy does. In Proverbs 18, it says, there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. My older brother was probably my best friend. I could talk to him about, about anything. But there's a friend that sticks closer. His name is Jesus. And he sticks. And he's always there. He's the kind of brother that you need. There's no adversity there, but he's pretty much the leader. You know, it's just a, a crazy thing about him being a friend, Jesus. Sure, he's the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, the creator of everything that's been created and worthy of all honor and glory and power and dominion and everything that is named. Jesus, King of kings, Lord of lords. And the craziest thing of all is, he's my friend. Wow. You know, people like to talk about famous friends. Well, I'm a friend with so-and-so. Name dropping. <laughs> well, I drop my friend's name too. I'm a friend of Jesus. And he's my friend. Even in Jeremiah 3, 4, Jeremiah is talking to God, and he says, Have you not called to me, my father, my friend, from my youth? You see, he has called you. He's calling you today. He calls you his friend. Back a couple of chapters in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 1, 5, it says, Before I formed you in the womb, I chose you. Before you were born, I set you apart. You see, that's, that's to you. Before you were born, God chose you. Before he formed you in the womb, he set you apart. There's stuff he has for you to do. There are things that he wants you to do that nobody else can do. You're unique. You're his friend, and he's got stuff for you to do. When he said to Matthew, follow me, he had stuff for Matthew to do. We need to stand up. We need to receive the friendship he offers. We need to be a friend to him as he's a friend to us. Because he's got stuff for us to do, places to go. We're called, we're appointed, we're set apart question is, are we listening? You know, what, is it, what does it really mean to be a friend of God like Abraham was? 
Well, Abraham received a blessing. In Galatians, go there for a minute. Galatians 3.14 says he redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles, that's us, through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Not only do we have the blessing, not only do we have the promise and the covenant, but we have the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to be God's friend? The Holy Spirit comes and lives in you. Jesus himself comes and lives in us, inside of us, in our newborn spirit. Yeah. We have the blessing. We have the promise. We have his spirit inside of us. We are in Christ, and the promises are, are ours. We have the covenant, the new covenant in his blood. We have the new birth. And we have the Holy Spirit. But I hear this phrase a lot of times among believers. It's not so common these days as it used to be, but I still hear it. People say things like, well, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. Really? It sounds kind of humble on the one point and kind of, kind of trying to be contrite or something. I don't know. We are saved by grace, not of works, through faith, so that no one can boast. It's the gift of God. But are we just still an old sinner? I don't think we are. I think we're a new creation. I think we're born again. I think we're the righteousness of God in Christ. We're a friend of God Almighty. We are not under the curse anymore. We are under the blessing of Abraham, the blessing of God. We are the blessed of God. You are blessed. You're not just an old sinner. You're a brand new creation raised with Christ and seated with him in heavenly places. That's where you are. You're not just an old sinner. You're a brand new creation. You're a friend of God. So do you know that? Do you believe that? Or do you still feel a little inadequate? Do you still feel a little like you're maybe not good enough? Well, I'm trying to do better. You know, here's the thing. You can't do better. That's why Jesus went to all the trouble and the pain and the grief to bear your sins on the cross because he knew I couldn't do anything about it. He did it to save me, to rescue me, to lift me out of the pit and set my feet upon a rock. As long as you're trying to do it, you're not standing in that grace. Maybe you think your faith isn't strong enough. Maybe you still feel under condemnation. Maybe you're still aware of your sin. Maybe you're still carrying them around. I've had people say, well, you don't know what I've done. No, I don't want to know. But Jesus has already paid for it. It doesn't matter what you've done. You can't do something so big and bad that God's grace isn't even bigger. The blood of Jesus covers no matter what. Let's go to Isaiah 43. This one always amazes me. He starts off saying in verse 18, Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. A lot of believers do. They still drag around all that sin. 
they still drag around all that rebellion that they did. They, they feel like God forgave them, but they just keep dragging it around. God says, forget the past. Don't dwell on it. See, I'm doing a new thing. In verse 25, he says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. Not for your sake. For his own sake. He blots out your transgressions and remembers your sins no more. You know, when you talk to him about your sins, he goes, what are you talking about? Well, you know that thing I did, and he would have to say, according to his word, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, that time I murdered so-and-so, I don't know what you're talking about. That time I hated my brother, I, I don't know what you're talking about. He blots out our sins and remembers them no more. So why do we carry him around? Why do we remember him? Maybe we shouldn't. Let's go to Hebrews 9, verse 12. Actually, verse 14. How much more then will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself, who offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our conscience from acts that lead to death. You see, not only has he forgiven you, cleansed, taken away the sin, but he's cleansed your conscience. And over in 10, chapter 10, Verse 22, he says, Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. And over in verse 35, he says, So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. You see, we need to understand who we are in Christ and believe that our sins are forgiven. They've been taken away. And our conscience has been cleansed. And that we can draw near. Don't throw away your confidence. Don't despise the gift and the calling and the blessing and the promise and the covenant that is ours. Believe it and walk into it. It's our duty to believe. That's what we're called to do. We need to find out who we are in Christ and to stand in it, to believe it, to not be caught up in our own past, but to look forward so that God can use us, so that we can go on the great adventures that he has for us, that we can do the things he's created us to do. Let's pray a minute. Father, I thank you. You're our friend, that you've created us, to be your children, to do things that you've planned in advance for us to do. I pray that you'll open our hearts and our eyes, that we can understand who we are and who we belong to, that we can see the things you're calling us to do, that we can know you as our friend, that we can rest in you and abide in you and know your great love for us. Thank you for it in Jesus' name. If you're here today and don't know him, 